Hello and welcome back to Tasha Could Make That. Today I'm sewing a plaid flannel jumper dress to wear over tops. While I'll do a full plaid matching tutorial soon, you'll definitely get a taste of it in this project. So back in November I sewed a 1950s pattern and made a cute pull on jumper dress that you saw me wear at the end of my turtleneck video. I'll link that video in a card in the upper right corner. I really like that dress but I decided I'd also like a version with a fitted bodice and waistline seam instead of a blousey bodice and elastic waist. So I turned to a pattern in my stash, Butterick B5748, a sleeveless 1960 reproduction pattern that I've made a few times in the past. I made a couple of modifications to the pattern pieces. To make it read a little bit more jumper dress, I lowered the neckline in the front and I also extended the side seams out a little bit to make room for an extra layer underneath it. I ordered this cotton fabric from the Robert Kaufman Mammoth plaid line. I love that mammoth plaid line and I've sewn both a dress and a tie front topper, both from 1950s patterns in mammoth plaids. This one is actually from their Mammoth Junior line. I guess they're supposed to be maybe more kid-friendly colors or smaller scale plaids maybe, I'm not really sure. I don't know, I just stumbled on the Junior line lately, but it's got a lot of bright and light colors for the plaids. So a red-orange plaid with light blue and yellow and pink accents, count me in. So here's the funny thing. You know how I said that I altered the Butterick B5748 pattern pieces? I remembered recently that I did that before, but I forgot. I made this vintage sheath dress jumper several years ago in stretch corduroy, and what did I use for the bodice? Yep, Butterick B5748, <laughs> dawned on me the other day. And so I went back and read my own blog post on the subject, which I'll link in the description, to discover I lowered the neckline and I had extended the side seams. Does that sound familiar to you? So unknowingly, I did all the same work again that I did several years ago. It's good to have pattern pieces that you keep for multiple variations that you make over time, but it's not good when you don't remember that you did it. So anyway, let's get to it and sew a plaid jumper dress. Now, like I said, this isn't a plaid tutorial, but you can definitely see some of my process when I'm cutting out this fabric. The first thing I did was decide how I wanted this plaid placed across my body. I usually prefer to have an empty space at the center front and center back. I think it's more visually pleasing when looked at from kind of a distance, but the added bonus is that for a center back zipper or seam, it means I don't need to try and get a vertical line matched up precisely along that center line. I just have to worry about the horizontal lines, although I have had to do this before, but if I don't need to, I prefer not to. I make sure I like the horizontal position of the plaid lines across the bodice too before I begin cutting. So in this case I went with a bit of a space between the base of the neckline seam allowance on the front and a line of the plaid. I also make sure that the center front fold line is exactly centered between two sections of the plaid lines vertically. And probably goes without saying, but I never cut plaid on the fold. It's so much easier to see everything on a single layer of fabric. After cutting the front, I cut the back pieces. I used the front piece to line up the positions of the horizontal bars of plaid to give me a starting point for how to line things up with the back pieces. I also make note of where the pattern falls right at the waist seam line on the front at the side seam and I match this to the same place on the back. There's a lot of fussing around to get this all right, but it's always worth it in the end. You can't match plaid up a bodice side seam all the way if there's a bust dart because obviously the dart will interrupt the plaid lines. So you can either line it up from the underarm to the dart or what's better is from the waistline up to the dart. So these horizontal lines will match up between the front and the back because of the way I've placed everything when I cut it. Here I am cutting out my third back piece. Yep, for as long as I spend prepping and cutting plaid, I still make mistakes and I accidentally cut a second back left instead of a right. <laughs> Whoops. You'll see here I have the seam allowance folded in on the piece I already cut and on the pattern piece. And I do this to help me line up the seam line at the center back exactly. I also use a little trick I came up with to place the fabric piece I just cut out back on top of the pattern piece to scooch it around until I have everything matched up. It doesn't really work on really unbalanced plaids, but it was close enough for this plaid to work out nicely, and it just helps me line everything up. So on to the skirt. I went with a three-quarter circle skirt here, which has a big front piece and then two separate pieces for the back. I positioned the skirt front the same as the bodice front, 
and roughly so that the first horizontal section of plaid will fall on the skirt in about line with the spacing from the bodice. I had four yards of this fabric and I used every last little bit for this. In fact, I was kind of cutting it close for these back skirt pieces to line up the print exactly. And in fact, in one of the corners, I ended up not having enough fabric by about a half an inch and fortunately it is in the seam allowance so I didn't have to piece it together or anything but I like I said I was cutting it close. Once the bodice and skirt pieces are cut out in a plaid I can breathe a sigh of relief so this plaid flannel was no exception especially getting so close to not having enough room for the skirt pieces that I wanted to use but it always feels triumphant when you get that to work. So it's just the little pieces left to cut out and then I can get started. First up, I use fusible professional grade interfacing on the facing pieces. I thought about using a lighter weight fabric for the facing pieces for this since the plaid flannel is kind of beefy, but I looked at a couple of past projects that I had used the same line of fabric for and I used the same fabric for those facings, so I figured I'd be fine. Then I prep all the darts to sew and any seams I can sew at the same time. I mentioned this in my winter novelty print dress video, but I like to batch up everything I can. So along with the darts for this dress that was sewing on the pocket pieces to the skirt, the facing, shoulder seams, and the long side of the belt. So I pin all that first and then on to the sewing machine to sew it all. I sewed all the darts that I just pinned and all the initial seams too that I could. And then I do the stay stitching around the neckline and the armholes to stabilize them. And all that was going swimmingly until four, three, two, one. So I was looking at one of my seams and saw tiny little loops. I don't know if you can see that. And realized that I must have misthreaded my machine. And so every single seam and stay stitching that you just saw me prep and sew, I have to sew again. I'm gonna walk away from this right now because... So I had to take a little break. Then I was up to pulling out all that stitching, which was thankfully pretty easy since the bob intention was totally messed up. So I just was able to pull it pretty much right out and then repinned everything and sewed everything again. And then I was finally moving forward and on to pressing all the darts and the seams that I just sewed. After the darts and all those initial things that I could prep and sew were done, including the stay stitching, I could finally start assembling the bodice. So I started off by pinning and then sewing the bodice shoulder seams. <laughs> and that was our dog Minnie sneezing in the background if you caught that at the end. So this is a bodice with an all-in-one facing, which you'll see in a second here when I get to the neckline. But before I pin the facing to the neckline, I serge the raw lower edges of the facing on both the front and the backs. If you don't have a serger, you could pink this or do a narrow hem instead. Time to pin the neckline. The method I use for this is one that I first learned years ago with the By Hand London Elisa Lex dress. And it's a way nicer way to handle all-in-one facings for sleeveless dresses with center back zippers than the way that's more typical of vintage dress patterns where it ends up involving some kind of odd way to sew the shoulders together and usually involves some hand stitching. This method is all done with the sewing machine. I'm probably going to do a tutorial sometime with my two favorite all machine finish ways to do all in one facings because I have another method I love for all in one facings with no closures. So let me know in the comments if you're into that. After sewing the neckline and before understitching the neckline, I trim, grade, and clip the curves. And yes, you are looking at that right. I use my rotary cutter to trim because it can't be bothered to cut around the entire neckline before I have to cut around the entire neckline with my duckbill scissors to grade it. It's always important to trim and grade your seams and clip the curves and understitch for necklines and sleeveless armholes, but flannel is pretty thick, so it's extra helpful in getting the neckline and armholes to lay nice and flat. Now I haven't mentioned it yet, but I'm sewing this entire dress with my walking foot because it's a plaid fabric. A walking foot is so helpful when working with stripes or plaids or really any fabric where you've lined up a print across a seam line and particularly with thicker fabrics as well. It feeds the layers at exactly the same speed so nothing shifts when you're sewing it. But I have to switch it out for a couple of jobs so I understitch with my edge stitch foot. And you can start to see just how nice that bodice is gonna look. And even in this thick flannel, how flat and nicely curved the neckline is gonna be after the understitching and giving it a good press. The trimming, grading, and clipping the curve is slow and fussy and honestly not my favorite activity, but it's totally worth the time and effort. 
It's a good thing too, because I'm about to have to do it all over again for the armholes next. Speaking of, it's time to pin the facing to the bodice at the armholes. Even though the neckline is understitched, you just flip the facings back out so the right sides of the bodice and facing unit are together and pin the armholes. It does start to seem weird at this point because you're basically closing everything up inside out, but there's a trick coming soon. Granted, this trick involves some minor miscalculations for me for this dress, but we'll get to that. Then I sew the armhole seams and I'm back at it with the trimming, grading, and clipping curves in preparation for understitching the armholes. Understitching the armholes is something that you can't actually do all in one fell swoop. You have to basically work from the underarm edge until as far as you can get your presser foot up into the shoulder area, which depends on how narrow the shoulders are in your pattern. In my case, uh, they're pretty narrow. This is part of my problem that you'll see next. <laughs> but you basically go from each side, so on the back and on the front, so it's kind of four passes of understitching, but it's definitely worth it to get the armhole to lay flat. And those few inches that you can't get at the top of his shoulder, it's totally fine. Okay, so now I get to talk about the magic of this all-in-one facing method and why I almost wasn't able to do it. Here's the magic part. You pull the back pieces through the shoulder to the right side. Here's where I almost went wrong. I kind of forgot how narrow the shoulders are on this reproduction butterick pattern, and I almost couldn't get my back pieces through the shoulders in this thick flannel fabric. I've made some wacky things work with this method, including when I sewed the 1950s jumper dress pattern I wore at the end of my turtleneck video, and I did an all-in-one facing with no closure and had to pull the entire length of the dress through the shoulder seams. That was definitely worse than this. Next time, I'd sew it with a narrower seam allowance or add a bit to the armhole edge, but I did manage it in the end, huzzah! Just needed a really good press to get out all the wrinkles from pulling it through the shoulder. Even with the side seams open, which is part of this method, so they'll come soon, you can see how nicely all that plaid is looking and lining up. The next thing I'm doing here is not a standard construction method, and it's not something I usually do either, although I've done it a few times. I'm actually attaching the skirt front to the bodice front, and then the skirt backs to the bodice backs. Usually, you construct a bodice unit and a skirt unit and sew them together at the waistline seam. The problem with that is that if you want to take in or let out the side seams, it's more annoying and you have to open up more at each side seam. If you sew a front unit and a back unit, you then sew the side seams down from the armhole to the bottom of the skirt. And if you need to take in or let out the side seams, it's an absolute breeze. Even though I know the waist size on this dress is theoretically correct, flannel can stretch and I was a little worried I'd end up with it being too big at the waist, so I wanted to make it really easy on myself to take in at the side seams if I needed to. So it's not a usual thing to do, but a good tip in case you want to try it sometime. After sewing the waistline seams, I looked at the plaid and realized it was lined up in the bodice to the skirt on the right side, but I messed it up on the left somehow. I thought about leaving it, but decided to unpick it and try it again, and nailed it the second time. I swear plaid knows when you try to do things in a hurry. And then it's time to wrangle the dress in its weird construction, and sew the long side seams, from the facing all the way down to the hem. I spend a lot of time carefully pinning here, particularly for the bodice, since the plaid lines should match horizontally from the bust art to the waist, the way I cut things out for the bodice pieces. I sew the long side seams, then serge the raw edges and press everything, including pressing the pockets towards the front. And at this point, the weird construction part is over, so now we're back to regularly scheduled programming and dress sewing construction, so it's time for the center back zipper. I sew the center back seam below the zipper before I serge it, and I give it a quick check just to make sure my plaid lines are matching up like they should be, and they are, so I can move on. Zipper time! Isn't this fabric looking so good though? Ah, oh, I really like this. Before I attach the zipper though, because this is a bulky fabric, I take the time to trim out the seam allowance at the waistline for the lap zipper on both back pieces at the center back. It'll just help everything lay flatter. And then I pin the zipper to the right side of the center back, the underlap side for a lap zipper. Sewing that's just another spot where I can't use my walking foot, so I just have to use my regular zipper foot for that. And then on to pinning the lap side of the zipper. I mentioned this in my winter novelty print dress video, but I always place a quilting ruler underneath so I don't accidentally pin through to the front of the dress. This is a place where I use a lot of pins, and I used a lot of pins for this plaid. Every little bit to help make sure things match up in the end.
everything was going pretty swimmingly at this point. I pinned and pinned and pinned and pinned, and then I was off to top stitch with my walking foot. And then, well, I realized I made a big old boneheaded error. Quite frankly, I always kind of wondered if the day would come when I top stitched my lap zipper and didn't catch the folded back lap seam allowance with the top stitching. And well, that day is today. I debated how to fix this, but ultimately decided that some invisible hand stitching was way faster than unpicking anything in flannel and redoing all that. So that's what I did. And once I had that little faux pas fixed, it was time to do the hem. I went with a simple narrow machine stitched hem for this three quarter circle skirt. And if you're wondering, is she really just eyeballing that hem? <laughs> yeah, I am. This is one of my party tricks. And here's the proof, both the beginning and the ending, half inch. Smooth sailing, sewing the hem on my machine with my edge stitch foot. I love when I get to do a hem this way. And then it's just finishing off the belt. I'm really happy that I had enough fabric to cut the belt on the bias because I know it's gonna look great. I love when you can introduce a directional change in plaid somewhere in a project. This one won't have a matching fabric buckle though because I thought the flannel would be too thick. So I decided to make a resin buckle to match instead, cast in a mold that I made from a vintage buckle. I pulled Instagram on which color to use and blue just edged out yellow, so blue it is. Well, I'm thrilled with how this jumper dress came out and I'm extra happy because with a couple of minor missteps along the way, I had some momentary doubts. But the plaid matching is perfect, the fit and the new neckline is perfect for this converted jumper, and I don't mind that the shoulder straps came out a bit narrower than I anticipated with the turn of cloth on such a thick fabric. I really love that bias cut belt too and the resin buckle I made. Pockets, flannel, perfect plaid, matching belt, what more could I want? And it looks good with the turtleneck that I made just for it too. So the outfit's complete. And just you wait because everybody who's been requesting resin tutorials or matching belt tutorial, I'll be working on both of those soon for you. And if there's anything else that I mentioned in this video that you'd like to know more about in the future, let me know in the comments. Please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Until next time, happy sewing, and I'll see you soon with more vintage fun. Bye.